Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Marianne Foucault, and I am a director of UC Berkeley Social Science Matrix. And I am really uh, delighted to welcome you today to our first uh, in-person author meets critic in, I don't know how long, <laughs> since the beginning of the pandemic. So this is a series uh, that features critically engaged discussions about recent books by faculty uh, at UC Berkeley in the division of the social sciences. So today's panel is co-sponsored by the UC uh, Berkeley Office of Sustainability. Uh, we will focus on Sarah Vaughan's book, Engineering Vulnerability in Pursuit of Climate Adaptation, which was just uh, published. Published. Professor Vaughan's book examines climate adaptation against the context of settler colonialism and global climate change initiatives using the case of Guyana after the 2005 flooding. So as always, I would like to mention a few upcoming events before we move on to um, and the discussion and the panel. So uh, this Monday on April 25th, we will host an online panel discussion called Watershed, Putin's Regime, Russia and the World. This important uh, discussion will feature four more key figures among uh, the Russian intellectuals who oppose the war in Ukraine. On May 5th, we will have a panel discussion, a part of our Matrix on Point series called Organize Power and Collective Action, exploring uh, the varied and, um, and changing terrain of collective action in the 21st century. And then on May 10th, we will have uh, our last Matrix on Point of the year, and that panel will be on the topic of 1 million COVID deaths in the United States since the beginning of the pandemic. So many more events can be passed and future can be found on the Matrix website. So I urge you to, um, you know, I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter and, and, um, and look, at, uh, look at our website. So now, uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator, Daniel Aldana Cohen. Uh, and Daniel will then uh, introduce uh, our panelists. So Daniel is assistant professor of sociology uh, at uh, UC Berkeley, where he's also the director of the Socio-Spatial Climate Collaborative. And uh, he also serves as a faculty affiliate in the graduate program on political economy. Um, he is uh, the co-author the co of A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal. Uh, he's currently completing a book called Street Fight, Climate Change and Inequality in the 21st uh, Century City. Uh, Daniel works on the intersection of the climate emergency, housing, political economy, social movements and inequalities of race and class in the United States and Brazil. And his research has appeared in various outlets, Nature, Environmental Politics, Public Culture, um, and, the, and also more uh, uh, um, newspapers and magazines such as Time, The Guardian, Time, The Nation, and elsewhere. Uh, he's been cited for his research and public engagement in the Washington Post, Bloomberg, Vox, The Huffington Post, uh, and more, uh, among others. So welcome, everybody. Welcome, Daniel. And I let you take it from here. Thank you all for being here. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Marion, for the very kind introduction. Um, I am thrilled to be here to moderate this panel on Sarah Vaughan's powerful, ambitious, unsettling, and exciting new book, Engineering Vulnerability in Pursuit of Climate Adaptation. This is a book that takes on some of the biggest stories of the 21st century, if not the biggest, climate change, the built environment, uh, racial politics, and does it in a way that is you know, surprising, profound, and as I said earlier, unsettling. Um, I am going to introduce the panelists. Let me remind you, any questions you have, please put them in the q and I will be monitoring Zoom and I'll introduce any questions from the Zoom into, uh, that are into the Q&A, into our discussion, uh, when we all, all take questions later on in this event. Um, Sarah Vaughan is the author of this brilliant book. She is a sociocultural anthropologist working at the intersection of environmental anthropology, critical social theory, and science and technology studies. Her research advances understandings of climate change in the Circum Caribbean while tracking the affective, ethical, and political components of dignity and belonging. 
At stake in her research are questions about the role climate change has in shaping the materiality of expertise and ethics of redistribution and narrative form. Uh, her new book, Engineering Vulnerability in Pursuit of Climate Adaptation, uh, which we'll talk about today, has already been awarded the Duke University Press Scholars of Color First Book Award. Her writing has appeared in a number of journals, uh, including Cultural Anthropology, Critique of Anthropology, Annual Review of Anthropology, Environment and Planning E, among other uh, outlets. Uh, among, and then we'll have two respondents. Um, so Stephen Collier is Professor of City and Regional Planning here at UC Berkeley. He studies city planning and urban governance from the broad perspective of the critical social science of expertise and expert systems. His work addresses a range of topics, including climate resilience and adaptation, emergency preparedness and emergency management, neoliberal reform, infrastructure and urban social welfare. And his current research examines urban resilience as a significant new paradigm and practice in city and regional planning. He's the author of Post-Soviet Social, Social Modernity, Neoliberalism, Biopolitics, and with Andrew Lakoff, The Government of Emergency system vulnerability, expertise, and the politics of security. Um, Shigato Ray is associate professor of South and Southeast Asian art in the departments of history, uh, in the departments of history of art and South and Southeast Asian studies here at UC Berkeley. His research and writing focus on climate change and the visual arts from the 1500s onwards. He's the author of Climate Change and the Art of Devotion, Geoaesthetics in the Land of Krishna, 1500 to 1850, which won the American Academy of Religions uh, Religion and the Arts Book Award, and he's the co-editor of Ecologies, Aesthetics, and Histories of Art, which is forthcoming, and Water Histories of South Asia, The Materiality of Liquescence. He is currently writing a book on Indian Ocean art histories in the age of Anthropocene extinction. I hope this has given you a sense of how rich and fascinating this conversation is going to be, and without further ado, I'll ask Sarah to come up. Thank you, Daniel, for the kind and generous uh, introduction. Um, so I thought a lot about how and why I would um, begin this talk, partially because um, if I remember correctly, more often than not, anytime I present on my research in Guyana, the first question is always, why Guyana? And my response has never been one about well, I had this long intellectual journey and I found myself in this part of the world that most people can't find on the map nor actually pronounce its name. But I did realize that anytime that I would be asked that question, part of the inflection of the question, part of the curiosity about wanting to ask that question, I would read of, that, of the speaker would be, why is it that we should care and how should we be, begin to care about places like Guyana that are often written off the map, particularly when talking about climate change? And so for me, thinking about Guyana then became a question about not just being this place, this place known kind of in a novel way as being a place of re-engineering feats, right? If one goes to Guyana, the first thing you see, especially as someone who's, for me at the time, by what, 2006? right after I finished undergrad, it was one of my first trips abroad. And I saw this space that was made up of these earthen um, infrastructures, right? Canals, large dams. And I just thought this was not of my everyday. Yet everyone I interacted with and everyone I knew in Guyana over my time there, now roughly about 19 years, would say, this is how I know where I live. This is how I get off of a bus. This is how I know how to um, move through the land, is literally how the land is marked up by this grid that by this point is over 200, 200 years old. So in order to make sense of Guyana as a place itself, I wanted to begin to understand what are the investments of understanding that place, not just politically or socially, but also in terms of its material and built landscapes. And so as I began to do research on climate adaptation more broadly as a problem that was becoming important to anthropology, um, also environmental humanities, critical social, social theory, I got really interested in how is it that we pick places to do research. And that question about how one picks places to do research really is one about the interest and motivation behind thinking about case studies. And so one of the authors that I really point to to think about the importance of case studies um, is Lauren Berlant, 
She's a really short, neat, and fun article called On the Case in Critical Inquiry. I think it was 2007 or 2008 when it was published. And she offers this sort of um, nice, sort of short, to the point, and blunt sort of claim about the importance of case study methods for thinking through not just social science practices, which is oftentimes how we think about case study methods, but also why and how it is that we think about the stories we tell one another. And so for me, Berlin offers kind of a theory of the case. One being the case study is a problem of narrative form as much as it is of content, right? So when we think about what a case ought to be, it's not just saying what is the evidence that we have, the data we have in order to tell our story, but also what is the form that we want our story to take. Also, a case study represents a problem space that animates judgments about particular historical events, figures, places, things, and people. So very much, uh, a case study um, approach is performative in its own way, right? When we decide to pick a place to do research, when we decide to talk about a place, and when we think about the problem at hand, it's also a way to say we're generating excitement. We're, we're generating a kind of way of understanding how history ought to be told. Thirdly, for Berlin, around this theory of the case, we also bring in evidence, data, knowledge forms that allow us to organize publics around a, a certain shared sense of meaning and understanding. And so importantly, when we wanna think about a case study or what offers us a kind of a case, we're inviting our reader, our audience to take seriously that there's a way in which we, again, ought to think about the kinds of knowledge that we produce and share. And so not surprisingly, right, the kind of case study method or kind of theory of a case is kind of a disciplinary act, as well as one about practice, right, where we invest in kind of rule based uh, conventions for folding in the singular into the general understanding of the world, right, so we can think about case study form across a variety of fields, law, medicine, psychoanalysis, even ethnographic cases um, in, in, in the instance of anthropology. So for me, when, I, when I've read Berlant and when I've thought critically about why, why Guyana, why now, um, this question of narrative decision-making is always at play when thinking about this case study, not just as a problem of methods and data collection, but also the ways in which, again, we wanna tell stories and why. And so I see engineering vulnerability as a first step towards thinking about the role of the case and the form of the case when thinking about climate change as a global problem. And so the book plays with and makes visible the problem of the case study with critical attention to the particular activities, technologies, modes of being that are related to climate change, to climate adaptation. So with that in mind, I do think about climate adaptation as a kind of form of a case study, offering um, a way that um, to detail the national histories of settlement and judgments about the continued viability about living, dwelling, and inhabiting a place and why we think that those forms of settlement are important. And so um, interestingly enough, I would say there would, could be three ways in which we can think about climate adaptation as a mode of, of making uh, a case study as method. One, tracking certain assumptions about nation state settlement as, under th as understood through conventional sovereign investments in not only territory, but specifically biopolitical distinctions between um, racial majorities and minorities. Secondly, taking seriously that norms about settlement shape how people and institutions create archives about a place, right? So this might be somewhat taken for granted as um, arguably you have so many subfields within say anthropology, science and technology studies, environmental studies, um, studies of bureaucracy, what have you. But all of those different ways of understanding um, knowledge, how we relate to the world and our different governmental practices are all problems of settlement. And importantly, they have their own kinds of archives that will allow us to see settlement in a particular kind of way and process. And thirdly, when thinking about climate adaptation as a problem of the case study, it reminds us that settlement is an ongoing historical event, always being reimagined through and with the environments that we call home, right? So not surprisingly, settlement looks different in Miami than say it does in coastal Guyana, even though we might be able to find a lot of similarities. Um, in terms of living in coastal spaces. Likewise, settlement in Seattle looks quite different than it might look in Mexico. So throughout engineering vulnerability, I'm interested in how it is that climate adaptation compels 
or forces us to rethink the conventional tropes, themes, metaphors, and frameworks we use to talk about settlement. And so all of this, these questions about uh, what it is when we think about the narrative form and content of case studies, as well as the particular case study problem of settlement as it um, comes to the surface in climate adaptation, also, not surprisingly, begs question about the real politics of climate adaptation. And so for me throughout um, nearly almost two decades now, working on um, questions of climate change and climate adaptation, I've come to think about adaptation as always kind of a localized phenomenon because of the particular climatic risks and hazards that pose to settlement. And so not surprisingly, ecological processes or these more than human processes uh, have the capacity to shape ideas about a particular place and its peoples. Likewise, climatic vulnerability is a universal experience, as hard as it is, as it might imagine or see rendered or made visible through popular media, where oftentimes we see vulnerability is only embodied through particular subjects, places, or beings. It's important to keep in mind and, and at, or at sort of um, or center of our attention that vulnerability is a universal experience at least of climate change. At the same time, we also know that that vulnerability can be narrated in different ways based on one's particular experiences of settlement and site-specific ways of living and dwelling. And it's that sort of tension between the universal and the particular that is central to understanding climate adaptation as a kind of problem of a case study. Likewise, a story of climate adaptation as a governmental project and, and, and practice of policy making is also a story about pushing against modernist narrative forms of serialized time and um, general tropes about what it means of who has expertise and quote, who doesn't have expertise. If only because we know that UN protocols around climate adaptation have not started from the global, global North, but rather from the global South and well over 15, 20 years at this point. So what does it mean to start to tell the history of climate change from a different geography that's not the global center, right? That's not a global city per se. That's not the global north. That's a total, total reworking, I would argue, of the ways in which we understand, A, what a case study is and what it can do, and B, the importance of thinking climate change politics. And, it, and importantly, it brings together perhaps the methods and intellectual concerns of a case study, not just between the social sciences, for example, or um, between the sciences per se, but also humanities, right? And I'm thinking of well-known authors at this point for um, maybe the past five or 10 years now who have argued that the importance of thinking about climate change is how it reworks our modernist assumptions of not just temporality, but narrative form. I mean, Tev Ghosh, for example, to a certain, certain um, extent, Depeche Chakrabarti. The, this is all important if only because if we have a different kind of understanding of narrativized time and the form in which politics shall, should take, we, begin, we can begin to open up our questions about the importance of thinking about how we study, how we respond to climate adaptation as an actual global lived experience and not just an abstract risk. So with that in mind, I have found um, Guyana to be a really interesting case study, if you will, of climate change and climate adaptation. If not because, um, you know, technically and empirically, Guyana was one. Of, Guyana has been one of um, the UN sort of model countries, if you will, for implementing climate adaptation projects along the lines of just not adjustments around um, sustainable development, i.e., um, its low carbon development strategy started in. 2013 around the aims of Red Plus projects, similar to projects in Southeast Asia, um, parts of uh, Mexico, as well as other parts of South America, but also because Guyana and its government have taken um, broad steps to say, this is how one can structure and begin to think about in a global sense, not just where finance comes from, but also how we should structure networks of, res of, res of scientific research, as well as technological transfer for thinking about climate adaptation as a policy um, sort of um, world-making event. So importantly, as Guyana has, has gone on this path and road towards climate adaptation, specifically through UN and World Bank portals, um, they've, res they've been able to do so, I would argue, because of its particular nation state history of settlement. 
And that is, it's this long history of settler colonialism colliding with its response to um, its post-colonial um, socialist agenda. And as out of this very sort of um, coming together of the socialist project that by many accounts, not all to be fair, but by many accounts failed in Guyana, brought to the surface for many Guyanese the importance and perhaps contingencies of what it means to think about settlement in a place that has historically always been known to be quite vulnerable to sea level rise, coastal erosion, flooding, the list goes on. So part of this response for climate adaptation and thinking about it critically and, and arguably in an intellectual way and not just a kind of real politics way is understanding that the policy of climate adaptation is an effect of post-Cold War um, politics around what it means to think beyond just development aims, as well as to think about how these states that saw itself on the, um, I would say, margins of Cold War era science, climate sciences in particular, now have to respond and to adapt to the very vulnerabilities and world-making projects that failed them during the Cold War era. And so out of understanding this particular history of Guy and its place within the contemporary moment of climate adaptation policy and arguably leading it for better or for worse. And at the same time, this longer history of settler colonialism against this project of, of, of a, one could argue a failed socialist project, you get this idea of climate adaptation as kind of a global project precisely because it's not simply, as I was suggesting, a problem of development Ism, but also very much an epistemic response and challenge to paradigms of science, paradigms of militarism, and paradigms of racial political orders. And I want to stress this point about racial political orders, because the stress here is not one about, say, racial capitalism. It's not one about, say, um, simply racialized marginalization, but rather the different ways in which globally, not just from the global north or not just from American context, race gets constructed and understood as a kind of um, social hierarchy. And how that problem got re-articulated through and has been um, since the Cold War era, questions of, of settlement, right? Questions of climatic crises. Um, so understanding then how these lived experiences of race perhaps exceed the problem of economy, exceed the problems of just policy work and how people have had to struggle and live with the very daily realities of climatic risks and environmental changes and vulnerabilities that still have them identify this longer history of race, but at the same time, pushing them to think otherwise, precisely because of these failed political projects and climate adaptation being a response. And then finally, um, I take seriously that when thinking about climate adaptation in Guyana as these um, kind of models of and for thinking case studies, Guyana makes visible the, rattle, the rather subtle ways in which settlement has always been dependent on archival logics in the sense that there's a belief that, there are that we select particular objects and events of the past as worth preserving while others are not. And that's precisely, I would argue, what's at stake with climate adaptation. As one tries to think about what it means to move forward and what makes sense for the best way to make settlement or dwelling and inhabiting a place possible, you're taking seriously about what worked or didn't work in the past and trying to move forward in order to think a new world and to think a way in which life can be made sustainable. And part of that work, I would say in a general sense, is this kind of archival work, this kind of archival logic that becomes central to thinking climate adaptation. And not surprisingly, this problem of a case study, right? In the sense that a case study is always this performative work of trying to keep an archive of something. We might not, know, not always know what that archive is for, but it will always be there at least for a point of reference. And so, you know, as I said um, initially in my comments, for me, um, Lauren Berlant's um, work on thinking about genres and the practice and sort of the narrative form and content of case studies are quite important. And I think working through this book and working more broadly uh, around my work on climate change, ethnographically and historically, has really gotten me to think about a theory of case study is not just, again, about hermeneutics or the interpretive frameworks of narratives, but also that there's an ethics right, to doing a kind of um, theory of, of case studies. That, that is, there's a way, there's a 
mode of accountability that comes into play, right? In the ways in which we wanna tell stories about places and the struggles that people have in trying to figure out how they wanna take accountability specifically for the stories of climate change that they tell. And so, you know, not surprisingly, perhaps in the Euro-American context, but particularly the American context, the struggle over the accountability about the stories we tell are quite obvious around climate denialism, right? Um, or this idea of the ways in which we say, give light to particular groups of people or places that might be vulnerable to climate change and not others. But I wanna to suggest too that not surprisingly, this problem of ethics, this problem of accountability and storytelling is central to a theory of a case of a case study, as well as really thinking about a critical kind of social theory of climate change. And I would say arguably I, I attempted to get at this problem of the ethics and accountability of, of case study method and um, climate adaptation, working through um, this theme of measuring apparatuses, as well as modes of collaboration, as well as kind of um, I, I try to um, name throughout the text a kind of political work as well as ethical work of counter-racial thinking and how it is that counter-racial thinking or the ways in which people try to take race seriously but at the same time try to create distance from it as they move forward to think about new pro processes of settlement and inhabitation um, that are integral to climate adaptation. How that very kind of work of trying to think with measured optimism or, or hope actually plays out as people invest in technologies and as people invest in particular stories to tell or to silence as they um, work through climate adaptation. I really think those are the kinds of um, ethnographic questions and ethnographic modes of insight that really get after what climate adaptation looks like on the ground as again, not this sort of abstract problem of say global UN governance and policy making, um, usually from global north um, um, cities every couple of years, but rather how it might also play out with these um, sort of not just afterlives, but um, working kind of embodied encounters that happen in the day to day between ordinary citizens as well as experts um, on the ground as they take seriously that settlement is se itself is part of this um, process of climate adaptation as much as it is part of trying to understand how our modernist ways of seeing the world are very much in tension or at least in flux as we think um, and respond to uh, climate change. So I will say um, generously, like that's, that's where I am right now as I'm working through the book. And given that it is my first book, I do find it um, quite, um, yeah, lack of a better word, word Daniel, unsettling, right? As I tr try to figure out, wait, what was it that I just invested in for so long? And now what can I make of that? Um, I'm gonna give you guys the work today of helping me figure that out. But um, this is where I've landed. So I look forward to your responses. Okay, thanks, um, Marianne and Daniel, and for the invitation to um, closely engage with engineering vulnerability by Sarah Vaughn. Um, I've read pieces of this book before, both in drafts and in other publications, um, but I was very glad to be provoked to read the whole thing through. Um, it's a very rich book on a lot of different levels. Um, it has a certain kind of pacing and logic that sort of gains force through the accumulations of examples and sites and episodes. I would say it's also a, a quite challenging book. Um, it's not a book that gives you a kind of architectonic at the beginning or uh, elaborate theoretical discussion to say like, let, let me tell you for 10 pages what's about to happen or where we are, um, but instead offers some sort of subtle references to various bodies of literature and social science thought. So um, the way I've structured my comments is partly in the spirit of sort of reconstructing what I took to be some of the crucial moves in this book. Um, I'll explicitly pose some questions along the way, but I hope that the reconstruction will also just um, provoke some um, response and discussion. So this is a book about climate adaptation, um, and much of the work on climate adaptation, and this includes my own work, is concerned with a particular problem of futurity, namely how we bring a future of climate change into the present, how we make it known, um, how we structure action in the present around it. Um, but engineering vulnerability takes up, I think, a different problem of temporality. 
namely how knowledge about flood and work to address the risk of flood shapes, and this is a quote, um, the way in which the past is perceived and confronted by people. Now, it's important to specify how the book um, explores this question, which I think is one of the main thematic issues um, in, in the, the project. Um, so there's now one familiar approach to which um, Sarah just very briefly alluded, which is to examine how structures of inequality determine the way that people experience climate change and how they relate to climate adaptation, projects of climate adaptation. And in a subtle way, this book is working against the grain of these accounts. Um, it acknowledges, and indeed it gives us a kind of extensive account of the way in which colonial racial formation has fundamentally shaped the constitution of political subjects, the settlement of land, the management and the mismanagement of water and patterns of vulnerability among other things. And it also traces how legacies of colonial racial formation have been reproduced if reinflected in various ways in post-colonial political subjectivities, um, most centrally for two once subordinated settler groups, namely, namely Afro-Guianese um, descendants of slaves and Indo-Guianese who came to Guyana as laborers um, following the abolition of slavery. And the most prominent marker of this persistence, the persistence of these histories of racial formation is, um, I'm gonna get the pronunciation wrong, but you can tell me what the right pronunciation is, apanjat, all right. Um, it's a phrase that means vote for your own kind. It's a principle of racialized political identity. But the book introduces a twist that I think is really the heart of the matter. It insistently refuses to see these structures and inheritances of the colonial and post-colonial states as entirely determinative of the potentialities of a contemporary moment that is defined by, among other things, various kinds of efforts to adapt to climate change. Um, indeed, I think the book is, first of all, a search for what is referred to, and um, Sarah briefly mentioned this, counter-racial thinking. Um, which is defined, and this is a quote also from the book, as an ethico-political stance whereby people simultaneously acknowledge race while creating distance from it in order to imagine a new, a new or at least different kind of engagement with the planet. So the contemporary moment in which the book is like, located is framed by the massive Georgetown floods of 2005. And the book marks these floods as first of all, a kind of political conjuncture. The reigning political party, was I think the PPP, if I remember correctly, was unable to constitute the meaning of this event by blaming it on a racialized political adversary because, and this is again a quote, the intense flooding affected every citizen and district simultaneously and with the same intensity. Moreover, the system of racialized patronage was partially blamed for neglect of water management infrastructure that contributed to the floods. An alternative political foe or adversary was found in climate change which again, and I'm quoting, shifted the terms of political engagement. Both experts and ordinary citizens began to perceive existing forms of racialized political subjectivity as a barrier to the newly identified national priority of climate adaptation. So a couple of questions I think immediately present themselves. One is that the book passes fairly quickly over this crucial observation to which Sarah also alluded that the flooding affected every citizen and district simultaneously and with the same intensity and that this undiscriminating experience of exposure, vulnerability, and loss opened up the space for new political possibilities. Um, one can see how this might be the case, and I guess we have examples such as war that have pro pro proved to be these sort of profoundly unifying moments, at least at one level. Um, but that unifying character is often illusory when one scratches below the surface, and I think this is arguably the case in, in World War II in the United States, for example. And one could also imagine equally um, precisely the opposite result. And I thought, for example, of John Barry's um, uh, kind of amazing book um, on the Great Mississippi Flood of 1927, which amplified logics of racialization rather than um, creating a kind of opening for new um, kinds of political possibilities. So this is a first question about this kind of de democratizing and leveling character of the flooding. Um, did it really mark a significant shift in Guyanese politics and what explains the fact that the flood would be experienced in this way? Um, or alternatively, um, perhaps for, to understand this claim a bit differently, perhaps it is not so much that the flood is a kind of critical juncture with a definite causal legacy, but an event in the Deleuzian sense. It opened up certain kinds of possibilities or virtualities that may or may not be made actual. In this case, we might read the book 
and I think this is the right way to read the book, um, but you can tell me if I'm wrong, Sarah, um, as an exploration of that virtuality, of possibility of counter-racial formation. So the way that engineering vulnerability explores the contemporary moment framed by the 2005 Georgetown flood is not by looking at political discourse or by focusing on the actions of political elites. Instead, it draws on the toolkits of science and technology studies and on new materialism to offer an account of human and non-human agencies engaged in climate adaptation. So the main characters in the book are soil types, climatic patterns, water flows, administrative routines, devices of measurement, systems of standards and bureaucratic documents, as well as various kinds of people who are engaged in the pragmatic work of climate adaptation, engineers, civil defense planners, workers in participatory adaptation programs, and residents of areas affected by flooding and by climate adaptation projects. It is in the practical work of these characters that the book seeks out counter-racial agency. This focus on a pragmatic terrain of both human and non-human agents raises another um, question or series of questions, namely, what is the status of counter-racial thinking, which is the sort of critical um, figure in this book? What, where precisely does it reside? And in the sense of actor network theory, how strong is it? Um, notably, the idiom of racialized politics, this upon jot, vote for your own, is clearly marked in emic terms. People have a word for it. They reflect on it explicitly, and we can see its effects very clearly in the structure of political parties and platforms and in systems of racialized patronage that have shaped parts of the civil service. But is that true of counter-racial thinking? Does it have a name? Is it explicitly articulated as an aspiration? Or is it more of an etic category, an analyst's term that identifies diverse practices, material formations, and kinds of collectivity, maybe all of them emergent or again, virtual rather than actual. I think one area to explore these questions is in the work of engineering and engineers who are among the central actors in the book. Um, very early on in this book, we find an affirmation, I think, of engineers' work as they develop plans for improving system of water storage and drainage that is a key terrain of climate adaptation in the coastal plains of Guyana. The book claims that the logic of Apan Jat uh, this is a quote, has never been a convincing motivation for the work of engineers. It also claims that all engineers would agree that the long period of racialized patronage and state administration contributed to the poor maintenance of water control infrastructure and thus to the 2005 floods. Moreover, and this is another quote, engineers have approached their craft through practical decision-making that created space to hope for political change or at least to imagine a future in which race did not define the means and ends of expertise. I found a curious resonance with, but also a crucial divergence from the kind of role that has been assigned to engineers and engineering in other contexts. For example, um, in the progressive era in the United States, um, engineering was held up as a kind of ideal of impersonal knowledge that could play a key part in a modern democratic polity that was faced with complicated problems whose solution required technical expertise. The idea was that in contrast, to the mischiefs of party faction or the particularism of local and sectional interests, engineers were impartial arbiters of truth and purveyors of apolitical facts who could use objective methods to solve problems in the public interest. And we see some suggestions of a similar ethos in the book, as for example, an engineer's claim that their goal is simply to pursue climate adaptation as a national good. So this is technical knowledge in the public interest above the fray of politics. Now, um, there's been a lot of criticism of this idea of engineering and this role played by engineers. Um, critical social scientists have charged that engineers wield abstract models that treat the natural world as mere instrumental means to human ends, that they reduce complicated problems of public policy to calculi of cost and benefit and obscure complex political motives and interests, including the interests of racialized groups. So I wanted to ask, um, what is the understanding of engineers and engineering in this book? What accounts for the elements of counter-racial thinking and practice that are identified in their work? Um, there's some elements of a kind of sociological explanation or answer to these questions that focuses on training and professionalization and on engineers' relationship to state institutions. But mostly, we get accounts of these mundane de details of their practice, um, which is notably strikingly different from the analysis of engineering in much critical scholarship. 
So the engineers we encounter are not the wielders of abstract models who imperiously dominate the natural world. Rather, they are cast as pragmatists who allow their work to be shaped by the agency of local materials and by hydrological or geological processes. They do not act as the arbiters and embodiment of collective interests, but are instead one actor involved in forging new kinds of collectivity. They are, in a sense, themselves new materialists, and again, pragmatists, but now in a kind of political philosophical sense, or at least that's um, a, a hypothesis. <laughs> um, so there are many other questions I'd like to ask and issues that we could discuss, but um, let me just land on one last issue, which is the title of the book, which is Engineering Vulnerability. Um, so when I first approached the book. Um, my supposition was that this title was going to refer to a phenomenon that we might associate um, with the dynamics of what Ulrich Beck calls risk, risk society, namely um, that the great engineering works of what he called first modernity to manage risks um, have, have themselves turned out to produce vulnerability to uncontrollable and catastrophic risk. And the failure of a system of water management that results in massive and devastating floods, as in the case of Guyana, would be one key example. Um, but that's not at all what it seems like engineering vulnerability refers to. And um, interestingly, the only uses of the phrase engineering vulnerability that I could find in the book, outside of references to the title, um, referred to something totally different, which was to critical analyses of climate change, and specifically anthropological analyses of climate change. Um, and these are theories that posit, and this is a quote, um, that race, racism is the key to understanding human survival in the Anthropocene. And the argument, as I understand it, is that in imposing a particular diagnosis of racialization and racism, such analyses figure or engineer vulnerability in a particular way and foreclose understanding, and this is also a quote, of locales where knowledge of race and climate change are already being reconfigured and challenged through practice. Um, so one thing that I would say is that I'm curious about this use of the word engineering, which seems very different from the analysis um, that's found in most of the book. And I wonder if we can square this circle by saying that anthropologists can, perhaps unwittingly, act as bad engineers, and that engineers can provide us some guidance for good anthropology. So uh, let me also begin by thanking everyone. And it's a wonderful conversation and to be in person, to be in person. <laughs> so, um, I, oh. So let me let me begin by Margaret Stall in the Fringe of Georgetown. Figure one point one in the book. Margaret, Sarah tells us, worked at the Georgetown Botanical Gardens and Zoo, but opened a stand to sell sweets after the floods of 2005. Entering the image through a temporary bridge, a salvaged umbrella, recycled canisters, in the foreground, two boys sitting on plastic chairs, I stopped in the middle ground, where a young boy stands almost heroically framed by lush vegetation, road signs, and broken skeletal infrastructure. The verticality of the boy, in contrast to the horizontality of the bridge. <laughs> 
opened up the conversation of what does the topos of a damaged landscape looks like. I stopped and looked again. What are we to make of him? The boy who turns away from the camera to ask us, how do you write when we drown? How do you witness climate change? Figure 1.2, soil. Figure 4.1, a photograph of a mid 20th century photograph of a worker's housing barracks. 5.5, 5, kitchen gardens, canals overrun by vegetation. I could go on. How do we record a history of shocked space and torn time? As an art historian, I must admit that the question of visuality, visualizing, vision animates my own thinking about climate change. For that reason, very self-interested ones, I must admit, I aim to focus on one thread, one thread of the many in Sarah's engineering vulnerability that foregrounds the function of political imagination. Sarah begins by stating that the aim of the book is to tell the story of how climate adaptation's importance lies not in its technological feats, but also in constituting political imaginations. Race and how race shapes climate adaptation is certainly co-constitutive and I'm thankful to Stephen for bringing these, uh, these, uh, co co these notions of race and Jat, and I was also thinking about the word Jat in relationship with the word Jati from where the word Jat comes. And I was thinking about caste, for instance, and how caste works within this matrix of race. But this analytical framework of belonging and exclusion. But I'm also thinking of Amitav Ghosh, and Sarah, you may refer to his work. Amitav Ghosh's off cited quote that posits the climate crisis as a crisis of the imagination. For Ghosh, the crisis of the imagination's imagination takes us to fiction, contemporary fiction, and its purported in inability to engage with what he would call the great derangement. For Sarah, concepts, subjectivities, and imaginings function through the everyday encounter with earthly material, soil, water, plants, I made some notes on the ground, embodied encounter. For me, this intersection between matter, material, and materiality, and imaginings enunciated through images, films, intimate conversations, archival research, takes us into the domain of the affective. Anthropocene visuality, as, some, as, a, as theorized by many, is a top-down modality of imperial aesthetics, the conquest of nature by converting it into a picture mm. that emerges in the 17th century. And one can think of visualization itself as it was used in terms of the war machine in the early modern period, when you could not understand what is happening on the ground, you visualize. So for me then, the negotiation between visualization and being on the ground becomes a complex maneuver. Anthropocene visual uh, imagination then in engineering vulnerability works at the level of the earth. It is perhaps not a coincidence that the illustrations in the book force us to see from the perspective that is not looking down, that is not top down, that is not aerial. soil, being close to earth. Climate crisis then produces a different imagination of politics in all its messy practices, rather than a clearly defined theory. Margaret tells us that via Sarah. The know-how informed all the mess she saw during the disaster. So I wonder, Sarah, if I could request you to speak a bit about the role 
of messy imaginings, visual, visceral, bodily, corporeal. And of course, the question of the earth itself as an archive, watermark as knowledge, soil as knowledge. <clears throat> this on the one hand, on the other hand, and a related theme in the book is the question of expertise, the heterogeneity of expertise. Whose expertise? What is expertise? Where is expertise? When is expertise? And I'm thinking of Ranajit Guha's argument that small voices of history were obscured by the double burden of unmitigated silence on the one hand, the silence of the archive and status din, not as a repository of ethnographic cultural difference in the words of Spivak, but the materialization of a political aesthetics that works around the historical contingencies of floodscapes. You discuss the colonial moment and it, how, how it marks our present, how has the notion of expertise changed over this longer jury history? How do we record a history in fragments? How do we record a history of forgetting? What are our archives? Where is the archive? The foundational violence of colonial modernity that shaped and is now undoing the world. How can we imagine alternative futures in the wake of it all? And these are just some opening thoughts. And I know I am, we all are eagerly waiting to hear more from you, Sarah. Okay, thank you. Sarah, I think um, it's your turn. Oh, so it's <laughs> very intense noises here. Okay, this is better. Um, so I'm looking forward to your responses. And those of you on Zoom, please put any questions, any comments into the Q&A uh, as we'll be getting to those very soon. There, go ahead. Uh, thanks. So where do I begin? I think uh, I, see, I see an overlap here with um, both responses on this sort of curious, um, this questioning, right, of what expertise is and why it matters in the situation. For me, it matters in the situation. It began with this question of what is the archive of this place, Guyana? And how does that archive relate then to secondary um, literature as well as historiography on a place known as um, Amazonia as well as um, the Caribbean? So arguably for me, much of that secondary literature and archive as well, not surprisingly, didn't have much on experts in the sense that um, if one thinks about anthropology of the Caribbean, much of what's understood as the expert is this kind of vague white colonial authority. Um, when one transitions then into an ethnography of a post-colonial present, that question of the expert sort of fades and we get this sort of figure of this political strongman that becomes the figure that makes politics, makes worlds happen. And so I was wondering how this erasure of expertise happened and why in ethnographic archives, as well as in ethnography proper secondary literature. And so for me, doing this project um, in Guyana in the field, I realized that there are many experts already there, not in the sort of, um, not just in, in the sense of the bottom up sort of um, figure that we understand as Margaret, or as we understand as, as the you know, other kind of hustler or um, husker on the street corner, but also these engineers um, and other kinds of technocrats within state agencies that had to specifically take over the aims, directions, technologies, um, working institutions of, of the colonial past. I wanted to understand how those very people, those middlemen who were sort of written into, again, um, secondary literature and ethnographic texts as these kind of simply political strongmen actually had other kinds of agencies, actually had other kinds of identities. 
Um, given that Guyana's particular adaptation projects were around infrastructures, which I, I took as um, kind of coincidental, one could argue climate and can show that climate adaptation takes shape around other kinds of projects, not just infrastructural projects. But in Guyana's case, because of the 2005 disaster, it was hydraulic engineering. I wanted to understand then who was this engineer, who was this local expert who understood the burden of this colonial white gaze at the same time refiguring that white gaze into something else, whether technically or as well politically. And so for me, expertise is this kind of, I think it's being suggested in both cases, this kind of haunting, right? This kind of question of how do we figure out how to embody a kind of expertise about climate adaptation where the past is, is a kind of burden, right? These infrastructures, these colonial projects that we know have failed so many different kinds of people in Guyana's context, um, but at the same time, something that can't be let go of, right? No one got in Guyana I ever came across said, blow up the dam, blow up the sea defense. They all wanted those projects to say, but to be remade in a particular kind of way and with particular kinds of aims that could afford space for people to live in more sustainable ways. So with that in mind, I wanted to take seriously about how does one then write about um, how expertise gets re-embodied, whether through the human form um, as engineer in this, in this case, or Margaret in um, her case of understanding what the 2005 disaster was, but also in its more than human form, in the sense that these are all earthen um, infrastructures in Guyana, more or less. I mean, um, the details of the book um, follow uh, the digging of the Hope Canal that took on also um, um, some technical components that, of course, had con concrete structures with it. But, you know, for the most part, all the canals and large scale dams in Guyana are earthen. So to take this idea seriously, that one can think about engineering works as taking on different kinds of built forms the world over was also an important way of trying to locate and make material in a real way what engineering looks like in the day to day. Um, beyond, to your point, this idea of abstract formulas or um, mathematical models. Um, so for me, I think expertise is both a question of, yes, ethnographic empirical evidence. How has the definition of expertise changed over time? I, I think I would argue expertise was understood under the colonial moment, early um, post-colonial moment as a problem of power broking as much as technical will. Um, and by we, by the time we need to understand and think about climate adaptation, expertise also comes a problem of trying to rethink political imaginations proper beyond this problem of, of um, racial political um, formation. So um, I think then this problem of engineering, um, as um, Stephen has pointed to, this question, and let me get this straight. Um, we see, and, and I like the way you put it, yes, engineers, for me in an obvious way, become um, um, characters who are new materialists themselves. Um, yes, I do take this, I do take this claim seriously in the sense that um, why is it so difficult for social scientists, particularly, or soft social scientists, um, to take seriously that those in the hard sciences, those who do technical kinds of scientific work also understand what the social is. They do on the ground. They just do in a different kind of language, um, and that language was is is one in which they play with the boundaries between, um, you know, human agency and more than human agency all the time. They just understand. I, as I got, as I as I understood in the field um, with Guyanese engineers, that they need to be very conscious of the times when they call out um, when humans can't do things and have to just let the floodwaters go. Um, and I think that kind of critical work of understanding the boundaries of the human and more human forms of agency is a critical um, interjection and claim of new materials literature. Um, the problem is new materials literature has a particular archive that has not taken into account necessarily the specific geographies of how that expertise comes about. So in a very kind of crude sense, where's my new materialist theory of, of, of more than human agencies that understands the work of a black expert, right? Or understands the work of a brown expert that had always through its social life and being understood that there is a, a political play between um, the human and the more than human. And that play shaped the way in which one could understand themselves as an expert. And so I think um, my, the crucial point here is that um, 
Guyanese engineers have always been sort of in the middle of that story about what it means to be an expert, a technical ex, a techn techno scientific expert who always has to play with politics. Right, politics was never on one side of the of the field to talk about, and and technology on another side, and and thou shall meet when you know the expert becomes you know enlightened. No. Um, the black or brown or Guyanese engineer is already trained into. That's a part of the professionalization of being an engineer um, before they have to be told by the activists, right? So um, the point here is that there are different kinds of genealogies of expertise that have perhaps not been as central to the way we, we meaning in the soft social sciences, think about what constitutes new materialism or think about what constitutes a philosophy of technology. Um, a grounded example would be um, and I've been pointing to this um, recently, um, Norman Gervin, who's a well-known political, or was a well-known political um, economist, Jamaican, um, wrote in the late 1970s, early 1980s, his own philosophy of technology. Um, I would argue, he didn't use the word philosophy, but he definitely used my concept of technology is embodiment of technology, recognizing the limits of sort of a Marxist or political economic framework to understand technology transfer in the global South. And his response was, well, right, we can't just talk about wages, we can't just talk about, um, you know, balancing checkbooks to understand how technology transfer happens. We also, also have to understand how people live with, meaning technocrats, make do with and tinker with these very technologies that have been degrading over time, even though they can't find, you know, finance or resources to manage them, but they figure out how to do and, and, and recreate and innovate what those technologies are. And he called, that kind of work and embodiment of technology. Likewise, I sort of see thinking about techno scientists playing out on the ground in similar global, con global South contexts like Guyana as a problem of understanding that um, the work and the play of the boundaries, boundaries between the social and the technical or the social and the natural, um, sorry, I should have said technical and the political or the human and the more than human is always already a kind of part of being professionalized as an expert in these post-colonial global South contexts. Um, so that's on this point about um, what is expertise, why the particular expertise of engineering in this context. And for sure, I think um, engineers are a great um, character to work with and against new materialist approaches for thinking about um, climate change. Um, and that leads me, and, I, and as you pointed out, Stephen, to this point about um, how do we think about pragmatism in the context of climate adaptation and climate change and the importance of, of thinking about practical work and the work of, 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 of taking seriously that uh, one's responses to climate adaptation can't be molded through, say, a given rubric about what it means to be political, right, or a political identity. Um, those very identities are always being reshaped and refined as one does the work of climate adaptation. And I think this is what inspired me to think about something as an edict category, yes, and concept, counter-racial thinking, is that it's something that comes to, to light as a problem of, and I think at some points in the book I say pursuit, more so than this clear kind of um, sort of um, point on the you know, voting ballot that you check off on and say, this is my identity. No, in fact, I think it's much more a problem of a practical kind of working through the everyday that comes to the fore as someone says, oh, is this the way to dig the trench? Oh, no, is it another way to cut the trench? And if so, this is how we can move forward to make sure we don't flood. But it's through that very work. And again, hear me indebted to a kind of new materialist thinking about what it means to think about um, mode of expertise and what constitutes um, the making of identities, is that it's through those very moments that people can aspire to or work toward the kind of what I'm calling counter-racial um, thinking. Um, and whether or not they go to the, to the um, ballot box and still vote for their own kind, the point is, is that those moments are still in the background, right? Those mo moments are still making a kind of inflection point or a way of, of a, to think about the world in different kinds of ways. Even if one still falls back on traditional identity categories or ways of being, they still have those moments and experiences to make sense of, wait, what does it mean to um, work through climate adaptation? And so there's a number of examples of that in the book, for example, when farmers have to think about compensation, 
for a canal being dug onto their land, or um, those who live with Margaret and Sophia have to think about the ways in which they might invest in or step away from community-led climate adaptation projects. So yes, to your point, Stephen, I definitely think of counter-racial thinking um, as a kind of edict category that in different kinds of ethnographic contexts might um, emerge and see itself in different kinds of forms or embodiments. So I think this is part of my point is that oftentimes American Academy, when we think about race, it's very much understandably so from an Americanist perspective that we see this binary in the spectrum between white and black. Yes, but need us remember, right? That this is one kind of historical example and very recent one, and yes, a very much entrenched one of what a social hierarchy looks like. Right? Race is simply for all that is that it's worth, and I have a very crisp, much more crisp definition of the book, is, is simply a social hierarchy, right? It gets embodied, reworked, and imagined in very different complicated ways in different contexts. So yes, even though slavery happened in Guyana or an indentured slave um, and servitude happened in Guyana and or Fiji, race doesn't look the same way in those two contexts, right? Similarly, race doesn't look the same way in Guyana as it would in America, um, the list goes on. Um, but the point is though, there's a, rec a general recognition as many have argued and debated and have offered theories of race, that it is a kind of hierarchy, right? That can be played with. So for me, counter-racial thinking is simply this work to think about what does it mean to think otherwise to this hierarchy? Right? And what does that otherwise look like? How does it get embodied in different ways, even as we struggle with and hang on to these very kind of traditional categories of say, white, black, um, Indian, uh, list goes on. Um, and, oh, go ahead, please. oh yeah, and then the last point I wanted to make about this problem of, of visuality and how it um, marks our kind of imaginations. Um, I think um, part of the work here too was to try to think beyond visuality, as you pointed out, and thinking about all the different ways in which um, empirical claims about climate adaptation get, get reworked through different kinds of senses. Um, and, I, and it's not in a kind of romantic way that I would say touch, smell, or um, um, hearing, for example, would, would reshape the ways in which we think about race um, by no means. But I do think that it helps push people to think um, different kinds of imaginations that aren't always all clear cut. For example, the work of engineers um, trying to um, redesign um, a dam in Guyana. All of that work is just not simply, not surprisingly about modeling or abstract um, formulas, for, formulas about what constitutes a design of a dam, but also a kind of field work that embraces different kinds of sense-making practices and knowledges that, as I argue, push up against, play with, and challenge um, this kind of racialized hierarchies that have for centuries shaped the way in which engineers, of course, see themselves as experts and work through state and private institutions. Thank you so much. We've just got a couple of minutes. I wanna ask one question from the chat. Do we have time? Oh, okay, I didn't see, yeah. Um, uh, there's a couple of questions, but let me just ask one sort of, I think, cleaner, shorter question. Where does gender fit? Do you apply a gender lens and how does that fit into the book? Yeah, um, for sure. So um, I take up questions of masculinity through the work of engineers and um, other um, specific technocrats in this case, which are military officials. Um, and I definitely see expertise as work through a lens of gender. Um, not surprisingly, um, what has been understood as sort of feminine expertise of, of flooding is understood through a domestic space in Guyana and that of a kind of public understanding of expertise is seen as kind of masculine if only um, get into this book historically, the ways in which compensation was made through slave labor for responding to flooding was usually through the task work of male workers. Um, and part of that understanding then of irrigation and drainage gets mapped on then to eventually the professionalization of engineers in Guyana, which not surprisingly until very recently has almost been completely male. Um, and like, likewise with the military, um, given that they're first responders for um, flooding and adaptation work, um, most of them are male. So I very much take up a question of masculinity and expertise in tech. Great, should we wrap up? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, I think we have one minute left. So uh, unless there's a final question that you want to take up. 
there's a long question which I'll share with you afterwards, Sarah, which just sort of um, just engages on the conversation we just had about um, racial politics. I just want to say um, I am really, really thrilled with this conversation. I, taking away the book, definitely wanted to hear and think more about expertise and was really provoked by some of the comments you made about counter-racial thinking and distinguishing that from some more conventional forms of kind of anti-racist thought and environmental justice studies. And I feel like you laid out uh, in a lot of richness today um, uh, further elaborations of those themes. So I thought this was a really, really rich discussion. It brought out some of the biggest ideas uh, in the book. And I think for anyone watching will be super interesting for them to keep in mind as they go and read this book themselves. So huge thanks, um, Sarah, Thank uh, Stephen, Shigata, and to The Matrix for hosting this terrific conversation. And get this book. <laughs> it will change the way you think about climate, about adaptation, racial politics, expertise. And uh, yeah, let's be unsettled together and thank our brilliant <laughs> panel for their thoughts today. <laughs>